So uh, immunotherapies, we're talking about vaccine therapies versus immune checkpoint inhibitors, just to be clear. The top is not what we're talking about today. We tried them for a long time. They didn't work much. Some of them are still being studied, but we're focusing on these immune checkpoint inhibitors, and that's CTLA-4 inhibitors, aflimumab, PD-1 inhibitors, nivolumab from BMS, lambr lambrolizumab from Merck, and pd one inhibitors. Genentech has one that's under development. BM BMS uh, may not be developing theirs anymore. Um, I will be straight about these drugs. We're not sure how best to use them. We don't know who should get them. We don't, but we know they have the potential to be really big. Okay, it's very early in this process, but there are some signals to suggest that they might be useful in combinations. And I'm going to walk through some of those steps uh, right now. I think the first point is that they do have a unique toxicity. Uh, this spectrum is distinct from our conventional drugs that we're using today, right? And and this is classically how we develop combinations. We take a drug that has one toxicity spectrum and another drug that has a different one, and therefore we can stick them together with non-overlapping toxicities. Uh, ipilimumab is the most toxic of the, of the drugs. 60% have immune-related toxicity, which is enterocolitis is the most severe, and all the meldoma docs, not myself, but maybe some of you are whizzes at, at how to use steroids to get this drug, this, this complication back under control. Dermatitis, hepatitis, 10 to 15% with grade three to four toxicity in many series. The PD-1 inhibitors also cause immune toxicity, pneumonitis, diarrhea, but perhaps less common, though still 13 to 14% with grade three to four. So, so they're not a walk in the park, but, it, but, but it's not hematologic toxicity, nausea, neurotoxicity. This is not the same toxicity as we see with our chemotherapies. Uh, the main overlapping toxicity may be fatigue, and uh, Susan Tapalian presented some data saying that there is no cumulative toxicity with these drugs. There's idiopathic toxicity, but if you have a patient tolerating them, they can keep tolerating them for a very, very long time without developing late toxicity. Uh, so that is one signal that we may be able to combine them. I will point out that these drugs are not effective for everyone, uh, and this is a slightly different slide with the Genentech PL1 inhibitor from a phase one trial, um, which shows only a 33% response rate, a uh, 36% response rate in the PDL1 positive population. Again, it depends. This is not just lung cancer. This is across uh, multiple populations. Um, yeah, we think this PDL1 staining is going to be a biomarker, but it's not a definitive biomarker. These are not drugs with a 70, 80% response rate in enriched populations yet. Now, these biomarkers are in development. But if these are drugs that have a 30, 40% response rate in our biomarker positive population, yeah, then we're going to want something else to make them work better because that's not a sure bet. And I'm not convinced yet that these are going to be drugs that have a genotype driven target like erlotinib or crizotinib. So, so they're not effective all, all the way, and we want them to be better. The efficacy can be unpredictable. This is, I think, an important point. We are used to starting a drug, watching a patient. If it shrinks, we say success. And if it grows, we say, not for you, move on. And yet this is one of the index cases from the uh, New England Journal paper showing a patient, in fact, with EGFR mutant lung cancer, who after pretreatment at the two-month scan had growth. And what they said was, well, it's a phase one drug. Hold your horses. Let's see if we can get something late. And it then had dramatic response at the subsequent scan. And this kinetics of growth followed by response is now a well-described phenomenon using these immune therapies. This is really outside the box of what we're used to for our lung cancer therapies. And so what you see from this spider plot is uh, hidden in there a number of drugs that go up to even having a new lesion appear. And these patients have frank progression with new disease emerging, but they're kept on, on drug and then have a response. And this is up to 5% of patients can have this unconventional response phenotype with first progression and then response. Uh, that makes me uncomfortable. I would much rather have them get this drug plus something else that present, prevents them from growing. Because in my patients who have growing disease with new metastases, uh, I'm generally steering them towards something new before they met out and get sick quickly. Especially if we're going to start using these drugs in the first line setting to prolong life. Uh, no, I'm not comfortable saying uh, about those new brain, rat, brain mets, don't worry about them. I still think there's a chance this drug's going to help us. Because if not, something new happens, I want to steer them in a new direction. And so uh, uh, this unpredictability actually was also what was seen in the original ipilimumab data with uh, melanoma. What you see on the left is that the PFS curves are pretty much straight together, down to like 
you know, everyone progresses at that first scan down to about 30% of patients. Um, and so there's, there's very little difference seen in the PFS, and yet there's dramatic differences seen in overall survival. Progression is not a biomarker with these drugs. This is scary because progression is perhaps the most important biomarker in our clinical care of patients. And so what they've developed, these new criteria, the immune-related response criteria, where they say don't use resist measurement, use WHO measurement. When a new lesion occurs, don't just say a new lesion's occurred, but measure it. And then you have to use new calculations with pro two progressions at two time points before you change therapy for one of these patients. Um, and therefore, patients who have unconventional response using these criteria actually are just as good as our normal responders. Uh, this, this is going to be hard, I think, for us to incorporate into our standard practice. And so some other strategy to prevent these progressions, aka combination strategy, would be a helpful way to get back on track where progression is a conventional biomarker that we can use. So option one, learn a new criteria for progression and integrate it into your clinical care. Or option two, combine these drugs with some other active drug that provide, prevents progression and allows us to control the disease while giving them some time to let these immune drugs take effect and perhaps lead to durable response. I will point out that these combinations are feasible. This was the first phase one uh, uh, data uh, published by Naya Rizvi from Memorial Sloan Kettering. Uh, and this was nivolumab combined with cisgem, cispem, or carbotaxol. Uh, there were no DLTs. It was a dose de-escalation, so they started at full dose and then brought it down. They are going to be expanding it actually at a lower dose of the nivolumab because I think eventually some toxicity occurred. Response rate was 32%. Not that remarkable um, for, for a combination chemo study, but I will say it was feasible to combine them. So this does suggest that we'll be able to, to take these two strategies of therapy and put them together potentially as a first-line approach for our patients. Uh, they have this crazy phase one trial of nivolumab plus everything you can think of, which is uh, called the octopus study. There's about eight arms adding it to different things. They're trying it with Bev maintenance, with erlotinib, with ipilimumab in lung cancer, which I've understood so far actually is more toxic in lung cancer patients than in melanoma patients. Um, a, a maintenance nivolumab after a platinum doublet, I kind of actually like this the best, right? We just had this conversation about maintenance therapy. It'd be intuitive for our squames to give them chemo until four or six cycles, they have toxicity, and then switch them to this other drug that works differently, which is, does not use progression or response as a biomarker, and we use that to perhaps get the durability. I think that's a very intuitive way. Um, and additional arms are planned to combine different, different strategies. And, and I think lastly, the combinations are effective. This is the JCO paper from Tom Lynch looking at ipilimumab combined either concurrently with carbotaxol, phased where there are two cycles of carbotaxol and then ipilimumab is added after that, or lastly, just carbotaxol. This is a randomized phase two, uh, uh, and, and uh, this is the data so far, uh, squames and non-squames. And uh, I think I've circled the most important data, which is that the hazard ratio very much prefers the phased approach, give chemo, and then add the ipilimumab, ipilimumab after two cycles of chemotherapy, and that was starkly better than uh, chemotherapy alone, uh, both for PFS uh, and for overall survival. This is admittedly a, a subset analysis uh, uh, of one arm compared to two, and so it, it's not statistically powered, but has led to a phase three trial that's underway um, looking at this approach. And so I, I'll summarize by saying immune checkpoint inhibitors certainly hold promise, but because they're different than our, our normal drugs, I think there is reason to think that integrating them into other therapies is going to be a way to get the most benefit out of them. I'll say there are some troubles with combination. There may be idiopathic toxicities, hepatotoxicity that we aren't, aren't anticipating, and that's going to be a big stumbling block. And the second point is what do we give with our chemotherapies? We give steroids. And giving steroids along with an immune therapy may somewhat uh, limit their effect, and that's going to be something that will have to be figured out because uh, I'm not sure I, we want to be giving uh, steroids at the same time as these drugs. Um, so I, I think there's a signal that we should, should we pursue this. Of course, it's, it's hard to know what's going to pan out going forward. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff.